We're going to read verses 1 through 6. Thank you, Lord. Joshua chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Praise God. It says, And Joshua rose early in the morning, and they removed from Shittim and came to Jordan. He and all the children of Israel and lodged there before they passed over. And it came to pass after three days that the officers went through the host, and they commanded the people, saying, When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the priests, the Levites, bearing it, then you shall remove from your place and go after it. Yet there shall be a space between you and it, about 2,000 cubits by measure. Now, you know, I, this, I didn't put this in my notes, but I want to say this. Are y'all cold this morning? Yes. yes. All of a sudden, yes. I am like, cold? What yes. happened, brother? You jacked that thing way down. I, was, I mean, when the preacher says he's cold. <laughs> I got you. It was me. I was hot. Okay, but that's okay. But Troy, Troy's a man, and Troy's got to deal with the environmental changes. But if the preachers are rising out of here that are really cold. All right, Troy. I love you. I love you, brother. Praise God. All right. Sorry, we got distracted, but we're back on track now. I got to fix something real quick. Just give me one second, please. I'm so sorry. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Listen, so what I wanted to tell you is, is that in this story, I didn't put it in my notes, but it says, when you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the priest, the Levites bearing it, you shall remove from your place. It says that it needs to be a space between you and the Ark. I want you to know that that space, if you calculate it out, it's a little bit more than a half a mile. Now, I didn't put this in my notes, but I want you to know that the people of Israel could not get too close to the Ark of the Covenant. That there only the priests could enter into the holy place where the Ark of the Covenant was located because, see, Jesus had not yet gone to the cross. See, this is 1500 B.C., 1500 years before Jesus would show up. And the Bible teaches that the blood of bulls and of goats could not remove sin. And so because the sin debt had not been fully paid and it had not the work of God had not been completely accomplished, then what ends up happening in that particular situation is that... They cannot get close to the presence of God. But I got good news for you this morning. And the good news is this. Is that because of what Jesus did at the cross when he died for you, you can follow closely. But there was another reason, a practical reason, why they had to stay back. Because, see, God said you've never been the way that you're going. And we're going to preach a little bit about that this morning. And so they needed to make sure. You know, we're talking about millions of people following a direction where God is bringing them. And God's concern was is that if they stayed too bunched up, too close to it, and they didn't see the presence of God moving in before them, that they were going to miss the miscue the direction, and that they were going to go on the wrong way, and that they were going to get lost because they did not know where it was that they were going. Essentially, it was kind of like a GPS the GPS was going before them to lead and guide them, but they needed to make sure that they were following it appropriately and that they would pay attention to it and see it. So I wanted you to know those two things. All right. He says, verse four, yet there shall be a space between you and it about 2000 cubits by measure. Come not near unto it that you may know the way by which you must go. For you have not passed this way heretofore. You have never gone this way before. And Joshua said to the people, sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Now, we've taught many times before that what the word sanctify means, it means to be made holy. It be, means to be made, to be separated unto God. And so whenever God separates us out, he's saying, hey, listen, you need to understand something. You need to move away from where you've been before. You, you, you need to move away from the world because I'm bringing you to a new place. And that's what the essence of this story is about. It says, and Joshua spoke unto the priests, saying, take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass over before the people. And they took up the Ark of the Covenant and went before the people. Amen. So that's the story. The story is, is that the children of Israel is on one side of the Jordan River. All right? Now, I mean, I, sometimes I draw pictures. I'm going to just go ahead and draw you a quick picture. You ready? Y'all seen this picture before, right? Uh, and so this is, this is the Mediterranean Sea over here. This is this strip of land called Israel. This is the uh, Sea of Galilee, the Dead Sea, the Jordan River. And it's children of Israel were somewhere on this side of the Jordan. Because this is the land that God had promised them. Egypt is down here. Let me just draw you a quick picture of Egypt so you can see where they came from. 
God delivered them over the Red Sea. And now they've been wandering over here in a wilderness experience. They've been going in circles on this side of the Jordan. But God's saying, it's time for you to cross over. Is this exactly the place where they crossed over? That's not what I'm trying to tell you. I'm trying to tell you they were on the wrong side of the Jordan. They were on the wrong side of the wilderness. They had not moved yet to the place where God had always intended them to be. And I'm here to tell you this morning that that's where a lot of Christians live. Yes. That's where your preacher lived for about 12 years of his beginning Christianity. And many times people think they've crossed over Jordan, but the reality of it is, is that they're still staying on the other side of Jordan. This message is for every last one of us in this place, starting with the preacher and working its way all the way down to the little kids that are in nursery this morning. <laughs> it's something for us to constantly be reminded of. But let us be reminded a little bit about where we've been before. See, the story of Joshua teaches us that the lives of believers are often filled with elements of both victory and failure. And this time frame of this occurrence in Israel's history is after the exodus from Egypt, when God supernaturally delivered his people out of Egyptian bondage. You remember the story, they were slaves. They had been slaves for 400 years. But God showed up and he supernaturally delivered them from the bondage of Egypt, which is a type of the world, don't get bored with me when I tell you the same thing because his story stays the same. Because God delivered you out of Egypt. Amen. If you got saved, God delivered you out of Egypt you, because Lord. you gave your heart to Jesus. Hallelujah. And he said, you're coming out because you're coming out of the world. Amen. He delivered them from the bondage of Egypt and he delivered them from the bondage of Pharaoh. Pharaoh is the devil. See, the devil's trying to be in control of this world. There's coming a day when he's going to be thrown into Gehenna, which is the last death, and he ain't going to have no more say-so. But until that day comes, he's doing his job. You ain't got to worry about that. But the Lord wants you to know this morning, you don't have to live under Pharaoh's hand. You don't have to be a slave to Pharaoh anymore. You don't have to be a slave in Egypt anymore. No, God delivered you, and the way that he did it was through the blood of the Lamb. Yeah. Hallelujah. Amen. See, the work of God delivered you out of Egypt and out of Pharaoh's hand. He killed the old you that lived in sin and it planted the spirit of God in you that brings new life. I want you to know that the way that God delivered Israel that night was supernatural. It wasn't some practical message that delivered them. It was supernatural. God showed up, hallelujah, and he defeated the enemy and his people walked out that night in victory. He brings you new life. He set them free from the bondage of the world. Let me tell you something. This is the same gospel today. 1,500 years later after Jesus has died and resurrected and the apostle Paul has been called by God. Look at Galatians 6.14. It says, but God forbid that I should glory, save, or you could say accept in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. Because see, it's through the cross that the world is crucified to me. And I am crucified to the world. The old desires of the world are put to death in me through the cross. The new desires of God are birthed in me through the cross. I don't know how else to explain it to you. I keep telling you, I'm not talking about two pieces of wood. I'm not even talking about the fact that Jesus bled and died and was tortured on the cross. Yes, I'm talking about that, but I'm talking about what was accomplished in the spiritual realm when Jesus died. How he broke the power of sin, death, and hell by paying the penalty of sin, which was what separated you from the presence of God. But Jesus died on the cross and he paid your penalty and now he's giving you access. See, you don't have to follow a half a mile behind anymore. Amen. You can get real close yeah. to Jesus. Yeah. You can hear his voice. He's right there on the inside of you. He's whispering to you. He's speaking through his word. The better you get to know his word, the better you're going to get to know him. He Amen. wants to lead you and guide you this morning and he wants to pull you out yeah. of the world. But listen to me, the world wants to hold on to you. You know that. It's like... Can you imagine an octopus with all them tentacles and just like, and got, got all them tentacles stuck on you and doesn't want to let you go. And you just all wrapped up in all that world and all that stuff that you came out of. And you're trying to pull yourself away. But oh Lord, but guess what? Jesus crucified that. Jesus and what he did at the cross crucified that and he disarmed those tentacles that try to hold on to you. 
But you're going to have to learn to believe it. Amen. You're going to have to learn to trust it. The word of God says that the, the world and its desires and its power has been crucified unto you. And if you will let God have his way, he will change the desires of your heart. And hallelujah. He'll put new taste buds in your mouth. He'll make you want God more than you want Egypt. He will do it if you will let him. Is it going to happen all of, all of a sudden? Sometimes it does. But the truth of the matter is that more times than not, people get delivered out of Egypt and they find themselves in the wilderness. And that's what we're talking about. See, God told the Israelites to take the blood of a lamb that had no blemish. I'm telling you the story now about when God first delivered them out of Egypt 40 years before the spot where we are, where we read this morning. God told the Israelites to take the blood of a lamb that had no blemish. That's a type of Jesus in the fact that he had no sin. And to use that blood to paint on their doors a mark that would be recognizable on the outside. Then they were to go inside and to eat the lamb that had been roasted judgment in fire. And as they ate, they were protected. And as they ate, the judgment of death began to spread throughout the land. Now I want you to imagine this. I'm about to walk over there to that door. I'm about to make a point. If you were an Israelite on that night in Egypt, then what you did was you walked over here to this door and you went outside of it and you took some blood from the lamb and you painted it up here and on each side post. Then you closed the door and you came in. And so we're Israelites that are listening to the word of the Lord and we're on the inside now. We're on the inside and we got a lamb. And it had no blemish. We had to inspect this thing until we found that it had no blemish because Jesus had no sin. And even 1,500 years before Jesus would show up, God was already preaching the gospel so that you and I would know it. Don't tell, oh, I don't understand. Well, guess what? Hang around long enough and perk your ears up and you're going to start to understand because it's a real simple message. Man is in sin, but God has an answer. And the answer is to send the blemishless one, the sinless one, so that he can die on the cross so that your sin could be paid for so that judgment would not have to land on you and so here we are inside the house and we got a roasted lamb see the roasting of fire is representative of the judgment of God Jesus took your judgment when he went to the cross and here's this lamb this carcass a bone shall not be broken did you know that when Jesus died on the cross they didn't break his bones and it was on purpose they broke the prisoners the other criminals bones with a stick but with Jesus they pierced his side because it was prophetic the Passover lamb's bones were not to be broken. And instead of breaking his bones, they pierced him in his side with a spear. I'm here to tell you this morning, Jesus is your Passover lamb. And the judgment of God was laid upon him. And the children of Israel were huddled in their houses that night. And they were to eat all of that lamb. And I can only imagine, see, as death went through the lamb. They could see the blood on the outside. See, when you got saved, I know I've said it before, but some people are new. When you got saved, it's as though, spiritually speaking, God took, the, took, took a spray paint and he painted the outside of your heart. See, when judgment's going to come on humanity, you're either inside of Christ or you're outside of Christ. You're either in the house or you're outside the house. You're either still hanging with Egypt or you're inside of Christ in the church. It's not, it's not an in-between. We're either in or out. Amen. You're either saved or you're not. Now, if you're saved, there's the possibility you're still in the wilderness. But I got good news. The Lord wants to bring you out of the wilderness. Amen. But you can imagine yourself and you got this blood painted on your heart, the children of Israel on the inside, and you're partaking of the lamb. The lamb of God that was slain before the foundation of the earth. God says you are to partake of that. What does that even mean, preacher? I don't understand. To believe by faith in the one whom he sent to die for you. And to learn of him whom he sent to die for you. And this is not just something that I just, oh, I'm just going to read a little something, something today. No, this is a lifelong endeavor. Amen. This is, I, Jesus died for me. He gave his life for me. And now I'm going to give my life to him. I'm going to learn this book. Quick talking about the fact that I don't understand if I'm not spending any time in the book to learn. I hope I can just talk to you Amen. the way that the Lord asked me to talk to people. I'm just here to tell you the truth and I'm not talking to you about something that I don't know because I lived it myself for 12 years. A mediocre Christian, never even cracking the book and wondering why I don't understand the things of God. No, we got to crack the book. Amen. You got to go home and you got to do some of the homework yourself. Amen. Amen. The preacher is going to do some work and I'm going to present the word of the gospel to you. But if, if you don't ever read, if you don't ever listen, if you don't ever learn, 
how will you know even what I'm talking about? And now that's supposed to be my fault? Lord, help. Lord, I don't want to get in a bad attitude. Lord, help me. No, it's not my fault. It's not my fault. I'm called to teach and to preach the truth of the gospel. It's, and, but, but in order for you to understand, you got to do some work too. Does that make sense? I'm going to do my best, though, to break it down. Because we're all at different levels. All right? Y'all ready? That night, while they were in the house, guess what happened? The firstborn of Egypt was stricken with death. I'm talking about animal and child stricken by death. But the people on the inside of the house were safe because the lamb had taken the curse for them. The lamb had taken the judgment for them. And all around that night, the animals and the children breathing out their last breaths and their lifeless, limp bodies littering the streets and the floors of their houses. I can imagine it in my mind. Surely the cries in Egypt caused great fear. The cries in Egypt caused great fear. I imagine them huddled in their houses, clenching tightly to their children, covering their ears as the screams of mothers and fathers filled the night air. That sound that filled the air is the sadness of sin, church. It is the sound of the broken heart of the man or woman who rebelliously refuses God's will and continues their own way. And then finally judgment comes upon their life and they find themselves in the midst of this miserable place where they are. And they hate it and they cry out and they're beginning to feel the brokenness that's on the inside of them. Now I don't know if they noticed it or not because I wasn't in one of those houses. But I wonder did they keep their eyes focused on those bones that were left from that carcass on the table. That, that lamb that had died so that they could live. That lamb whose blood marked the outside of that door so that judgment and death would pass over them. There those bony remains of that lamb sat there quietly on their table. Did they look at that? Did they notice that? Did they remember? Because see, Jesus has already done his work, church. And Amen. it's written within his word. And we're expecting him to do something different. And the reality of it is, you know, everybody's like, oh, he's going to do a new thing. Oh, it's a, it's a new. Yeah, he's already done a new thing. I hate to keep repeating myself, but I don't know what else to say. He's already done a new thing. It's called the new covenant. This bread is my body. It will be broken for you. This blood is the blood of the new covenant. It will be shed for you. Jesus, the promise from the Father, his blood, the sacrifice came together at Calvary. And that is the new thing. And in the new thing, in the new covenant, faith in what Christ has done will release grace into your life. Amen. You need a new power source, church. Amen. The preacher needs a new power source. I need the Holy Spirit moving and operating on the inside of me, changing me and giving me strength in areas that I have no strength to overcome. Amen. You're not the only one. You're not, in this you're not in this boat all by yourself. Lord, help us. We're all human flesh. We're all marred clay. We all need help from God. And without the right understanding of where to put our faith, we'll turn around and put our faith in our own stuff. How much we read, how much we go to church, how much we do this, how many ministries we're involved in. Don't, don't shout me down while I'm preaching good. I'm telling you the truth. We have a tendency in our heart to put our faith in everything but the right thing. What's the right thing? That carcass. That quiet carcass that lie there that says, hey, I've already done it. It's a finished work and I'm here. If you'll just trust in me and you'll look to me, my spirit's going to go before you and I'm going to deliver you. See, that's God's plan. He desires for you to be a believer in his gospel. He desires for you to trust and to spiritually partake of that lamb. Look at 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Jesus is the Passover. I'm here to tell you the New Testament says it. If you ever have a doubt about anything regarding the word of God, oh, the preacher just says all kind of stuff. You know, he says that Jesus was the Passover. I don't know, but no, the New Testament says it. That's where I get it from. I just make this up. 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Let's look at that real quick. It says, look at this. Let's just take a little bit of time. 1 First, First Corinthians 5, 7. All right. Let's, let's, uh, 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Y'all ready? Purge. Out, therefore, the old leaven. Now, let me just stop a second and do a little teaching. You know what leaven is? I know most of you do. Leaven is yeast. Yeast is a sign of sin. You got to just take my word for it. I can't go all the way back and start teaching from the beginning. Just take my word for it. Yeast, leaven is yeast, and yeast is a type of sin. The Feast of Unleavened Bread in the Old Testament, they couldn't have any yeast inside of their house for a whole week. 
There's other places where Jesus said you, 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 the leaven of the Pharisees. He was talking about their false doctrine. Representative of sin. Representative of, of a false way. Representative of an old way. He's saying purge out the yeast. Get rid of the old stuff. Get rid of the sin that's in your life. Look at this. That you may be a new lump. Talking about a new batch of dough without yeast in it. Amen? Praise God. You know, yeast changes dough. I know we've talked about that before. You put a little pinch of yeast in there and you just step back and wait a little bit. What happens? Well, I'm telling you, microbiologically, what's happening is this carbon dioxide is being produced. And next thing you know, that thing starts to swell up. Same thing. Put a little pinch of sin inside your lump. Guess what happens? It starts to spread through the whole thing. It takes over. And it ain't just, you can't just sip a little bit of sin, folks. Amen. Right? Help us to remember this. You can't just take a little nip of sin and think that it's going to stop right there. That's not what it does. Sin starts to take over. It spreads through the whole lump of dough and it begins to cause changes to take place. Yes. Lord saying, purge it out. Get it, get it out of there. Because look at this. So that you can be a new lump. He wants, this, he wants to do a recreative miracle. Amen. He yeah. wants to start with a new yeah. batch of dough. Right? Look at this. He says, for even Christ, our Passover is sacrificed for us. Mm -hmm. There was a connection between Feast of Unleavened Bread and the Passover. I don't want to get into that right now. I'm just trying to make a point to you that Jesus is our Passover. Jesus is the fulfillment of that lamb carcass that laid upon that table quietly that night as the cries of the Egyptians, as judgment struck, struck their houses. That, that that's what the lamb is. Jesus is the fulfillment of that lamb. Jesus is why judgment and, and, the, and the judgment of sin will pass over you. And that instead you can walk out and be delivered by the grace of God. This is the grace and mercy of God. Born in Adam and born in sin, we deserve judgment. We deserve hell outside of Jesus because we have made choices that have hurt and offended and stolen and lied. We have transgressed the word of God and have charted our own course away from God. Yes. But when he sees the blood of Jesus covering you and cleansing your sin, he says clean. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Saved from sin. Washed in the blood. Sin forgotten not to be remembered anymore. Now get up and move. Get out of this place. You can't stay here. If you stay here in this Egypt, you will, if you stay here in this world, if you stay here in this wilderness, you will choose to live like them instead of living according to the word that I gave you. You can't stay right here. You got to get ready to cross over to the other side. I gave you my word so that you would know the difference between me and the world. I cannot, I will not have my people called by my name, living like the world. I will receive glory through the lives of my people in the way that I receive glory is that you get up and you get out. And you become a new person, a new creation. Let my spirit have his way in your heart. That's what the Lord would speak to each and every last one of us here this morning. No matter what you're going through, no matter what you're facing, no matter how holy you think you are, no matter how guilty you feel this morning, I'm here to tell you he's the same God today, yesterday and forever. His plan has never changed. He still loves you. He sent his son to die for you and hallelujah, the lamb took the judgment for your sin and God wants to forgive you and he wants to love you and he wants to pick you up and he wants to help you get over the Jordan. Hallelujah. You know, it took one day for God to supernaturally deliver Israel out of Egypt, but here we are 40 years later and Israel is still full of Egypt. They've been wandering in circles in the wilderness. They have refused to believe God in his word that he could bring them into the land that he had promised. He told them to go and take a look one day to see what he offered them. And instead of seeing the beautiful land, I'm, tell, I'm trying to remind you about the spies. You remember when God told the spies 40 years before, he said, hey, I want you to send me some spies to go into the land where I'm about to bring you. And I want you to come back and give the people a report. And so they had a representative from each tribe. And 12 of them went over there. And only two of them came back with a good report. So what they saw over there, instead of the fruit and the prosperity that God promised, I mean, listen, the fruit over there was nice. <laughs> I mean, the, the Bible says that on a stick, two men had to carry a cluster of grapes. I'm just telling you what the Word of God says. I believe the Word of God. Amen. But what they also saw over there were giants in the land. Now, I don't have time to break down where those giants come from. I don't, I'm not here to try to freak you out. But I'm here to tell you that the Bible tells us where they came from. And they were very evil. And I'm going to also tell you another thing. Whenever you start to cross over or you get ready to cross over, sometimes you're going to see things from the past of your life 
that appear to be giants in your life. That's good, yeah. Financial burdens. Yeah. Problems that you that you created on the other side of the Jordan. Mm -hmm. Things that you don't understand how wow. you're going to get past. Miseries and frustrations. And you look at that and you're like, I don't want to go over there. That place looks fearful to me. I don't understand what awaits me over there. Mm -hmm. And instead, I would rather timidly turn around and go back to where I was before. Or just stay right here on this side of the Jordan. Because if I stay right here, at least I'm not exactly where I used to be. I know I'm not where I need to be. Come but on. the giants are too big over there. That's good. And so what I'd rather do is just stay right here. I just stay right here. That's good. But the problem with that is that the word of the Lord says that he can't tolerate lukewarmness. He, he rather that we were either cold or hot. But instead, because we were lukewarm, he was going to spew us out of, our, out of his mouth. The Lord doesn't want us to stay lukewarm. The Lord doesn't want us to stay on that side of Jordan. There's only one kind of Christianity. And it's the kind of Christianity that gives their life back to God since he has given his life for them. Amen. The only two that came back with a good report is Joshua and Caleb. Their report was different than the other ones. See, sometimes you look over there across the Jordan and you're like, uh-uh. I ain't going over there. Them giants are big. Them problems are big. I'm going back the other way. Joshua and Caleb had a different perspective. You know, that's something that the Lord's been kind of speaking to me lately as I'm in my prayer time. There's a lot of scriptures that describe this, and the Lord just personally been speaking it to my heart. You know, now we're seated in Christ in heavenly places. He reminded me of the scripture of an eagle, that's, the, the ideas of an eagle that's soaring. And I just know that the Lord has been speaking to my heart. He's saying, just come up here. There's a song. I oh, remember that song by Jason Upton. Come up here, my beloved. Come up here, right? But the idea is, is that come up here where I am. Because the view up here is so different than where you've been. Sometimes when you look across the Jordan and you see those giants and it just looks way too big and it's like, uh-uh, I ain't going over there. That's it. No, you got to face it. Sometimes we have to face the situations that we've created from our past. Yeah, yeah. But I'm here to tell you that God will be there to get you through. Amen. He will. And then when Joshua and Caleb saw it, they saw it from a different perspective. You know what they said? They said those giants are bread for us. You ever seen how easy it is to tear a piece of bread? Those giants are bread for us. And if God wants us to have that land, if he's given it to us, he will give us the victory. And we will walk over there and we will be more than conquerors through Christ who strengthens us. See, that's what I'm trying to tell you this morning. I know I use a lot of words, but it's real simple. God is your victory. God is your strength. God is your strong tower. He is your refuge. Amen. He is the anchor that holds beyond the veil when the storm is raging. It's not you. It's not the preacher. It's not anything else other than Jesus. And so whenever you're going through it, you need to learn to trust him in it. Amen. The same happens once again to Christians today. They hear that Jesus died for them. And if there is true repentance in their hearts, they get saved and they embark on their journey with God. And then they, they ask themselves to look towards the place where he's bringing them. And they see that it's so different there compared to the place where they've been in the past. They have grown accustomed to the way Egypt was. Come on, somebody. Help me out here. Yeah. Grown accustomed to the way Egypt was. Sometimes they miss her music. They miss her food. They miss her drink. The men like the way their women look. Don't tell me that the men didn't like the way them Egyptian women looked. The women liked the way the men acted. Why? I don't know. But Because they were harsh and they were cruel. But I'm telling you, it's the nature of man. Why? I don't really get it all. Why? No. Do we really like it? No, we don't. But for some reason, our brain is trained towards this. Right? The world has a way of sinking its talons into us and convincing us that this is what we want. But no, it's our flesh that wants it. Right, right, right. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Lord, help us to trust you. Amen. And they would rather just stay on this side in limbo. It might not be where God wants me, but I'm not where I used to be. And they justify in their hearts that they're okay. But God's word says something different. And when God's word is spoken, then they're faced with a choice. See, when God's word is truly spoken, the people of God are faced with a choice. I'm talking about today, right now in this modern church where we live. They will either be willing to cross over and trust God or they will have to find them a new preacher. Because, see, a new mouthpiece, they need a new mouthpiece. One that will change the story a little bit and make it just a little bit more palatable. 
a preacher that will tell the story just a little bit different. You know, take a little off here, a little off there, and sprinkle it with a little bit of sugar so it will taste a little bit better for me. But that kind of preacher, let me tell you something, church, that kind of preacher is a lying preacher. Because you know what? That's not what the way the word of the Lord says. And this is the word that Jesus has for him or her that has left Egypt but refuses to cross over Jordan. I already said it, that he does not tolerate lukewarmness. God wants us to give all. Yes, it, is it possible that we're at different stages of our walk with God? Of course it is. Is it possible that some of us are just coming into the faith and we don't understand what all that means? Yes. Is the preacher trying to beat anybody up? No. <laughs> I've already told you that this word is for me before it's for you. But the point is, is that he's not okay with us staying put. Amen. He's a moving God and he wants us following after him and moving with him. Amen. 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 No, this is his word. And you know, one of the things I've learned is he died for his word to go forth. And so that it could enter into the hearts of those that would hear. And that in those hearts, his truth would fill them up with his hope. And the hope of God would give his people courage. And a man or woman of faith today would be like Joshua and Caleb of old who said, those giants are like bread for us. He will go before us. And he will give us the victory. And so here we are in our story. That was all my intro. You ready? Here we are in our story. God's people have been in a stuck place. They've been wandering for 40 years and God wants them to move. It's time to get moving. And that's point number one. Sometimes we're stuck. But when God says move, we need to move. Amen? Amen. Look at Joshua 3.3 3 again with me. He says... When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the priest, the Levites, bearing it, then you shall remove from your place. Now, there's a couple of things. I just try to imagine the scripture when I read it. Number one, you know, you're just sitting there in the camp. And I don't know that they blew a horn. It didn't say that they blew a horn. Sometimes they would blow a shofar. It doesn't say they blew a horn. It said, be looking. And he says, when you see the Levites carrying the ark, you got to get up and follow. When God gets to moving, you need to follow after him. Amen. Yeah. Amen. You know, just let me just say this. Just because a person is moving around doesn't mean that they're making any progress. In this story, Israel had been moving for 40 years, but she had not seen any real change wow. in her scenery. Wow. The promises that God had for Israel remained on the other side of the Jordan. When our movement is more about what we want instead of what God wants, and we won't really get anywhere. Amen. Oh, let me repeat that for you one more time. When our movement is more about what we want instead of God wants, we won't really get anywhere. It's God's will that we move, but we need to be told God's will. Amen? Amen. So, that, so that we can know it. So that we can choose it. Thank God for his word and the people that speak his word. Go back to verse 2 real quick. Thank God for the people that speak his word. The last part of verse 2. Moving into verse 3. The officers went through the host. The officers. The leaders. Went through the host. That, that's another word for the armies. The people. It can describe a collection of people. The officers went through it and said, hey, listen. Pretty soon... I'm just here to tell you, pretty soon the Levite's about to pick up the ark and they're going to get to moving. And whenever they get to moving, you need to make sure you're paying attention. When you start seeing it, when you start feeling that it's happening, you better get up and you better start moving and following after the ark of God. Thank God for people that tell the truth to the people of God. It says in verse 3, And they commanded the people, saying, When you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God and the priest, the Levites bearing it, then you shall remove from your place. Essentially, they were telling them that they couldn't stay here any longer. That it was time to move. The ark is the presence of God. Yes. But you know what it really is? It's really Jesus. I got to tell you, the ark is Jesus. Let me tell you how I know that. Contained within the ark was what? Come on, you Bible scholars. Holler it out there. I know a couple things, but what's the main thing? The man. The man. Yeah, but that's not, I don't think that's the main thing. The man. Broken. The, 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 the law. Yeah. The law of God. Was in the Ark of the Covenant. Did somebody else say that already? I'm sorry. The law of God. Amen. The law of God is in the Ark of the Covenant. There was other things. A pot of manna. There was Aaron's rod that budded. But the law of God. The word of God. Was on the inside of the Ark. And on top of the Ark. Between the cherubim was what? Where the presence of God resided. 
So in this box that's overlaid with gold, you have within it the Word of God, and you have upon it the presence of God. What is Jesus? The Word of God says in of Jesus that He is the Word of God. As a matter of fact, I didn't put it in my notes, but just so we can show the people, put up Revelation, I believe it's 1913. Revelation 1913. Jesus is the living Word of God that came from heaven and came down upon this earth. And he was clothed with a vesture, dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Jesus is the physical representation of the living Word of God. Jesus is the embodiment of the presence of God. That Ark of the Covenant represented Jesus. When you see Jesus moving, you got to look to see where Jesus went. You got to look to see what Jesus said. You got to look to see how Jesus responded. And that's how you learn to follow after the Lord. And you're not going to know any of that if you don't know the Word of the Lord. Amen. They were telling them that they couldn't stay there. Within there was the Ten Commandments in the presence of the Lord, the Word of God. See, you've been stuck in a wilderness, circling round and round, living in your sin, running from God's will for your life. It was His plan to cross you over the Jordan the day you left Egypt. The day I left Egypt. In other words, on the day you got saved, God wanted to pull all of Egypt out of you. But you or me, we liked parts of Egypt and we preferred to hold on to pieces of our old life. But you can't bring that with you if you're going to walk on the other side of the Jordan. You know, do we think that God just winks or blinks at our persistent life of sin and choices to stay on the other side of Jordan? Do we think that choices to remain connected to the world will not affect us? Do we think that living in sin won't deceive us into thinking that we're okay? I'm, ta I'm just talking to you from my heart this morning. You know, when you open up the door to sin, do you realize that, that it will actually lull you to sleep and it will put, make you go night-night yes. in your spirit, man, and you yes. will think that you're okay and the reality of it is, is that you ain't okay? Amen. That's why we need preachers that are willing to preach on sin. That's why we need somebody to tell the truth Amen. so that the Holy Spirit can convict us. Lord, please convict our hearts. And these officers went through the camp and they instructed Israel to get up and move. Let me ask you a quick question. How do you feel when somebody tells you you're in the wrong place? I don't know how you feel, but I've had it happen to me plenty of times. My older sister used to poke me all the time. She needs to go back to poking. If you haven't listened to this, you need to go back to poking, sis. Now, there's a right way to poke and a wrong way to poke. Amen. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I want to poke with humility. I want to poke with love yes. if I'm going to poke at all. But sometimes people just need to be told. Right. Something ain't right. And if nobody ever takes the time of, and, and tells us with love, but, but my question for you this morning is, how does that make you feel? You know, whenever somebody tells you that you need to get up and move, how does it feel if someone just comes up and asks, so do you, I don't know if they would do this. So do you really love your disobedience that much that you would continue walking in circles, disobeying God's will because you're so intent on doing your own will? You know, this is kind of weird. Yesterday I was at uh, Wilson's Country Corner. Why I was there is not what's important. I was there and I was waiting for the right time and I was actually working on my message. And all of a sudden I go into there to buy me a bottle of water and this dude comes up on his bike. Well, he came up right before me and I parked right there. And he's got like suitcases on his bike. And you, and, but the bike I look at, it's made out of bamboo. Mm. Like it's a class act, like got all the sprock, you know what I'm saying? Like this guy only knows how much this bike, all the gears and everything costs, but literally made out of bamboo. I could tell it was real bamboo. So I walk in there and I mean, he's got all his biking clothes on and he's filling up his water from the water fountain. He ain't even spending no money in that place. He, 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 he's on a mission, man. I'm like, dude, how far is this guy traveling? So I felt like I needed to talk to him. So I'm like, hey, bud, what's going on, man? Is that thing made out of bamboo? Yeah. I'm like, how do you hold that thing together? He said, uh, he's, he was German. So he had a very heavy German accent. But from what I understand, it's carbon fiber technology, the same way that they make carbon bicycles. It's like how you make that weld together with bamboo. I have no clue, but this dude, probably some kind of a mechanical engineer from Germany, knew how to do it. And he made his own bike out of bamboo. Wow. Then he proceeds to tell me uh, that I've been on, I've been, I rode 2,000 miles already. I'm like, oh, okay, what part of the U.S. did you start from? He's like, no, you don't understand. I done rode through Australia. I rode through Singapore. I rode through here. I flew over here. I started off in San Francisco, and I'm working my way to Miami Beach wow. in his broken German accent. And I'm thinking to myself, 
man, this dude is pretty cool. <laughs> wow. But how sad would it be if he rode all that way Come on now. and he never met one person that told him about Jesus? Right? So I'm like, Sebastian, <laughs> has anybody ever taken the time on this 2,000 mile journey to tell you about Jesus and how much he loves you and the fact that he died on the cross to set you free from your sin? And I kept holding his hand, and I know it was probably getting a little bit weird, but it wasn't. <laughs> I was like, because I got to tell you something, man. If nobody's ever told you that, you're going to get to the end of your journey, mm. and you can, you can mark my words. My name is Matt, and I'm believing God, and I'm going to pray for you that you're going to remember what I said, because there's still going to be an empty spot in your heart, brother. Mm. Because riding all this way ain't going to bring fulfillment to your life. Mm. And as cool as that bike is, it ain't going to do it. But don't forget that God loved you enough to tell you that somebody loved you. And that, that Jesus loved you and that he died for you. And he was, he was so kind. You know, those are European people. They just, you know, they don't know how to take us Americans. But you know what? That needed to be said. Amen. Amen. Germany might have forgotten their way. Germany has proved to some of the greatest Christian scholars that ever existed. But they're long gone. And Germany has given its way over to humanism and postmodernism. Yes. And now they don't even know about Jesus anymore. And it's just a book. Uh, the Bible is another book that collects dust on people's shelves. And they think it was written by man and not by God. And Lord help them. I don't know. But I know one thing. By the grace of God, Sebastian got to hear in one little moment of time that Jesus loved him. Amen. And I'm going to believe God that Jesus will touch Sebastian. Yes. Yes. And you know what? As I'm even talking about this, I remember Anthony. Anthony was an African-American dude that I was taking care of one time after the Lord first got a hold of me. I was working as a nurse in Doe Tree Hospital 21 years ago. And Anthony had jumped into the river because it was cold. And because he had been bound by crack. And he hated his life. Come to find out, Anthony was a big old man. He was about 6'3", 240 pounds of muscle. He laid up in that bed. And I can remember when I was getting reported, like, oh, Lord, we got a jumper here. Yeah, like, dude, if you really want to do it, why are you going to try to jump in the rib? Why don't you go da-da-da-da-da? So, you know, nurses are hard. I'm just telling the truth. Lord, help us. Sometimes our life is hard, you know, so we get hard. And I can remember the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart. And he said, that's yours. Take that. That's for me. You do that. I walked in there and I was like, hey, Anthony, how you doing today, bud? And I just started, I quoted a scripture to him real quick. I didn't care about that, man. I just tell whoever. And you know what? Every time I went in there, I quoted a little scripture to Anthony. And the next thing you know, and this is what surprised me around lunchtime, I started to quote a scripture and he finished it. Yeah. Quick. Boom. So I said, mm -hmm. so I quoted enough, he finished it. He was raised in the church. Anthony knew had gone to Bible school, you know, had gone to, gone to Sunday school. His mom and his grandma had raised him in the ways of God. He knew the word of God. But the world had grabbed a hold of Anthony and driven him down a place where he didn't want to be. Yeah. I don't know why. But sometimes I think about Anthony. I ain't never seen him again. They all were making fun of him. And I can remember that the Lord told me to give him this coat I had because he was embarrassed. He said... You know, I got to walk out of here in these warm-ups, man. And he's, you know, I just, man, my heart was broken. And I gave him this coat. I thought it was a cool coat. But anyway, he needed the coat. And I think about Anthony sometimes. I think about, I pray for him. And I'm like, Lord, please touch Anthony. Wherever he is. Wherever life has brought him, you know. And sometimes I just, I, don't, I know this doesn't have anything to do with my message. Other than the fact that I will tell you this. God wants us to cross over Jordan. So that we could be used. God doesn't want to stand in a stuck place. God wants officers that are willing to walk around in the camp to let people know, hey, you're in a stuck place. I want to do it with love and I want to do it with humility because I'm not trying to purposely. I have done that before and it doesn't work. I have purposely tried to show people how wrong they were when, guess what, the preacher wasn't right himself. But at the same time, people do need to know. They need to be told. We need to be told. How do you react? Whenever you're told, like these officers were telling them, you can't stay in this place. I don't care how comfortable you've been. You got to get up and you got to start moving in the right direction. Amen. You know, I would I would think to myself that the Lord would want us to recognize, hey, look over there. That's the same tree that was there last year. <laughs> like, in other words, you've done a lot of moving, but you're right back where you were before. <laughs> Nothing's been changing. The scenery is the same. When are you going to cross over and trust me? 
See, God will save us while we're in sin, but he saves us to deliver us out of sin. He wants us to move in the direction that his presence and word are moving. He wants his people to stir others up around them the way these officers did and let his people know, hey, you can't stay there. It's time to get up and move. Amen. That was point number one. I probably lost you. Point number one was sometimes we're stuck, but when God says move, we need to move. You ready? Point number two, a new day. A new direction. Look at verse 3 again. Joshua chapter 3 verse 3. It says, And he commanded the people, saying, When you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God and the priests, the Levites, bearing it, then you shall remove from your place and go after it, that you may know the way by which you must go, for you have not passed this way heretofore. You've never been here before. The place that I'm about to bring you, Christian, listen to me. You, if you've never been on the other side of Jordan, I'm telling you, you're going to have to learn how to hear the voice of God. And you're going to have to learn to know the word of God so that you can follow after God. If What this means is, is that on the other side of the Jordan, you've been following the desires of your own heart. You've been following your own flesh. You've been doing it the way you wanted to do it because it's what made you happy. But you can't keep living that way and expect God's hand of blessing to be on you. You'll never be able to receive the freedom and the liberty that Jesus paid for you or, or I won't if we stay maneuvering that way. God's not going to bless flesh. Amen. He wants to. It doesn't even mean when you cross Jordan that everything's going to go the way that you want it to go. That's right. Amen. No, let me tell you something. The devil a lot of times will get mad. We see that in the eggs in the story, right? Pharaoh said, oh, you want to go? Oh, I'll tell you what you're going to do now, buddy. You're going to make more bricks, and you're going to gather your own straw. Mm -hmm. See, that's one of the things that I can tell you is, is that when you start praying and asking God to move on, and to do a work, sometimes things start rattling. Sometimes things, oh, yeah. things start getting worse yes. around you. But guess what? You're going to have to hold on to God, and you're going to have to determine in your heart. I'm going to have to determine in my heart whether he's worthy to be served, whether things are going good or things are going bad. In the wilderness, every time they faced a trial, their inclination was to return to Egypt. They didn't remember that they were actually slaves. Instead, they only remembered what they enjoyed while they were there. Wow. Right. We definitely do that with sin. Christians will wander in the wilderness after salvation, refusing to cross over entirely to the side of God because they cling and covet aspects of their old life and simply don't want to push it away. Rather, they protect it. But in the story and in the Christian life, there comes a day of new direction. I've never been here before. Which way do I go? In the past, whenever I got to the point of uncertainty and didn't know what to do, I always turned backwards towards Egypt. But now I don't want Egypt anymore because, to be honest, I don't want to be a slave to sin or the world. Amen. Now, you know, you got to choose for your own self what your Egypt is. I mean, Egypt is the world. And in the world, there's a spirit that's driving. And, and everybody is affected differently by that spirit. Amen. For some people, it's drugs. For some people, it's relationships. For some people, it's alcohol. For some people, it's, you know, whatever. And then, you know, then you got the, I'm just saying, then you got the people that left the church because they're like, oh, he's always preaching on alcohol. Well, you can't prove to me that alcohol is, a, no, alcohol is a problem, dude. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it destroys people's lives. Mm -hmm. And listen, yeah. some people can sip a glass of wine and they can get away with it because it doesn't destroy their life. But they got, yeah. but, but other people can't do that. And I'm one of the people that can't do that. And I rec recognize the fact that when I drink, I don't I ain't nothing like a Christian. And you can sit there and fool yourself all day long if that's what you want to do. But if you drink and you think you're still acting righteous like the pre present, in the presence of the Lord, that's between you and Jesus. Figure it out. But the word of the Lord has specific things to say about that. But most preachers won't stand behind a pulpit. You know why? Because they want the message to be told in such a way that people are still comfortable and want to come back to church. Another, another, another example of a lying preacher. And I'm not going to sit here and lie. I done lived it. I'm talking to you about something. I just was sleeping at a Holiday Inn last night. I lived it. I tried to play the game, man. I sat at the table with the doctors and said, oh, now surely after this master's degree I am, I can sip a little wine with the doctors and everything's going to be fine. No, it's not. Because one led to two, and two led to three, and three led to four. Next thing you know, I'm drinking beer again. Next thing you know, I'm a mess. And not acting like I should be acting, looking at things I ought not be looking at, thinking things I ought not be thinking. Because I'm getting filled up with the excess of wine instead of the excess of the Holy Ghost. You get filled up with the excess of, that's Ephesians 5.18. You get filled up with the excess of the Holy Spirit, you start thinking different things. Lord, help us. 
What is your Egypt, though? Because you, you might be saying, but that's not me, preacher. That what you're talking about right there is not me. But what is your Egypt? What is it that you turn to? What is it that brings you comfort? You know, like that bowl of macaroni and cheese? I'm talking about the good one. Yes. Yeah, whenever you eat it, it's like, oh, man, that just warms my tummy right there. That makes me feel so good. What is your bowl of macaroni and cheese that you look to and that you hope to and that you cling to that, that brings you comfort on the inside but is not Jesus? Because whatever that is, that's your Egypt. That's what you keep going back to. Be like, oh, but this makes me happy. We're not talking about what that, about the happiness of man. We're talking about the pleasure of God. Amen. 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 But in the story of the Christian life, there comes a day of new direction. I've never been here, Lord. I need to. I need help. I don't want to be a slave to sin or the world. So when you get there, there are a couple of things you should know. Look at the person on the side of you. I want y'all to do that. Just look at the person on the side of you right now. Look at him. Look him in the eye. Look, I look them in the eye. That's the person on the side of you right there. There you go. You ready? That person may not be where you are. Can I say that again? Some of y'all people are so romantic. <laughs> I'm talking about them back there. They so romantic. I heard y'all just got engaged. Congratulations. That's a good thing. But I just wanted you to know that the person you just looked at may not be in the exact location where you are. That person, they, they, they may not be willing to cross over yet. If you love them, you don't have to physically leave, but spiritually you can't stay where they are staying. So when you're ready, there are a couple things that you need to know. Because, listen, not everybody wants to cross over. And there's some people in my family I wish were here this morning. I got to just tell you, not everybody's always willing to cross over. But, you know, spiritually, you can't stay right there. In the day of new direction, there are two things that are new. Number one, a new way that I've never seen before. Number two, a new lead that I follow. Number one, a new way. The way to where God is. You ready? John 14, 1 through 6. It's simple. Don't, don't tell me that my messages are hard because it's very simple. Amen. It's an easy reading of the scripture right here. John 14, 1 through 6. You ready? Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. This is Jesus talking. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, you may be also. And where I go, you you know and the way you know see Jesus is saying I'm about to go to my father they don't understand it all but he's about to go to the cross he's about to die he's about to resurrect then he's about to ascend into heaven and he said I'm going away and the place where I'm going you know and the way to get there you know verse 5 Thomas says unto him we know not where you're going and how can we know the way what are you talking about Jesus says unto him I am the way the truth and the life. No man comes unto me, but by, no man comes unto the Father, except by me. He is the access point. He is the road. The word way there literally means the hadas, a path that's clearly traveled. I know I've used it before in my teachings, but let me do it again. At least us boys, when we were young, we'd go play off in the woods. Now, I'm sure some of you girls followed some of the boys from your neighborhood and went played off in the woods too. And one of the things that you found sometimes, or you went hiking before, right? You've been hiking before, and what do you find? A well-worn path. I might, like, I'm all up in the brush right here, but look at that over there. That's a well-worn path. That's where everybody I've been walking. Boom. We find the path. We start. What? That's what the word way means. Jesus said, I am the Hadas. I am the well-worn path. God has made a way for you to be able to see yeah. the right way that you're supposed to follow. So whenever you get over Jordan and you're ready to cross over to the other side, there's a way that you have to follow. I still don't understand what you're saying, preacher. What, what do I do? No, I need a formula, man. I need you to tell me right here, right now, in my situation. It don't work that way, Christian. Yeah. It kind of does, but it doesn't. I'm about to share with you in a second. First of all, all I can tell you is get into this book. Amen. Now listen to me. When I tell you to get into this book, I'm not trying to tell you, oh, the preacher said if I read five chapters a day, then the victory and the direct. No, no, no that's not how it works. This is a lifelong endeavor. I, I'm not, I, mean, I said it twice today, right? Lifelong endeavor. I think I said it Wednesday, and I probably said it the Sunday before. This is a lifelong endeavor. And call it practicing medicine. Well, I'm right now, just today, as an analogy, I'm calling it practicing Christianity. Yeah. 
You read what's said in the book and then you go out there and you take the wisdom to apply it in life. And then when it don't work the right way, you reevaluate and you go back to the book. Amen. Right? And you learn from the failures and you learn from the mistakes. And God doesn't waste anything. He uses it all, the trial, the tribulation, in order to teach us the way that we should go. And when we go off the wrong way, we realize, guess what? That ain't the right way. And we go back to the book. And it's not just the book. See, Jesus said that. He said, because what we say, the ark had the word and the presence. And that's the direction. God's wanting to lead and guide us according to the word and the presence. Amen? Jesus is the word. He is the way. Hallelujah. There's a new way, and in order to know it, we will have to learn it and trust it. You know, I was listening to a preacher the other day. The message was from the early 1900s. It was a message that I remembered my brother-in-law Aaron telling me about a long time ago. It was called Ten Shekels in a Shirt. I'm, it's not important. What, I, that's a lot. There's too much information behind that. But it comes out of the book of Judges. And he spoke about it, something that was happening in the church that he noticed in the early 1900s. And he said that there was a new message that was coming and it was a contradiction to the message of God. And if he was living today, he would be like, wow, I prophesied that. But it was really, to be honest, it was already alive in Jesus' time and it was alive before then. Because it's in the story that we read about the children of Israel. That whatever's going to make me happy, if Egypt's going to make me happy, I want to go back to Egypt because I just want to be happy. I want to be happy. Yeah. The world says I want to be happy. It doesn't matter what God's will is. And that's the difference. That, that this world, this vapor that we call life is not for the purpose of making us happy. Amen. This vapor we call life is for the purpose of making a choice. <laughs> if you don't like this, it don't get no better than this, my friend. This is to make a choice. Are you going to serve God or not? Are you going to choose Jesus or not? Because listen to me, if the word is real, guess what? When you breathe your last breath here, you take your first breath there. And then eternity just begins. Right. You got to be able to believe me on this. Because I'm either telling you the truth or I'm not. And if, and if I'm telling you the truth, then life is more than just about what I choose today for my personal temporary happiness. But that's what he said. He said that there was a message that was in contradiction to the message of God. He said this message was humanism and that the end result of that message is that man would find happiness on this earth. It's okay just to be happy. And listen to me. There's churches filled with people today. You hear me? Where the preacher is preaching a message in a way that makes people feel happy. They leave feeling happy. They leave feeling like they're okay. They don't feel convicted by the presence of God. Yeah. They don't, they're not being told that there's elements of their life that may not be lining up with the word of God. You know why? Because he's more worried about a fanny in the seat and money in the bucket Amen. than he is about your eternal soul. Amen. I'm here to tell you right now, that's a problem, church. Amen. That's not the will of God and it's not the word of God. He said that this, that this humanism was to bring man happiness. He said any message that convinces man that he is, has the right to do what he wants to be happy is a message that is birthed in hell. It's a message that is birthed in hell and it's inspired by demon spirits. The end result of the message of God is that he receives glory. That message is birthed in heaven. That message teaches of self-sacrifice and death to self that results in resurrection life. That is a new day, a new direction. And in order to go that way, there will have to be a new lead that I follow. Jesus said, I will not leave you alone. I will send you a comforter. Amen. The word of the living God will lead yeah. you. Amen. But it's not just the word. Hallelujah. He will also send his presence, the unction of the Holy Spirit to show you. Amen. I'm going to close with with just a couple of scriptures. You ready? Psalm 119, 105. A couple simple scriptures. I'm following the lead. I'm in a new land. I'm going in a new direction. Psalmist David said this in Psalm 119, 105. The word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. You need to know where you're going. The Word of God, along with the Holy Spirit, will help lead and guide you. Don't you know that you need to hear from God on where to go and not just my opinion? I mean, don't get me wrong. I believe God gives me wisdom. I believe I can. If you come to me and you speak to me, I believe I can. But sometimes, dude, it's it's tangled up. Sometimes it, and you need to be able to hear from God. Amen. Amen. Lord, help you if I give you the wrong advice and then you take a wrong turn. Amen. No, you need to be able to hear from God. People around you might not understand the decision that you're making, but if you heard from God, Amen. hallelujah, that's what you Amen. need to hear from. Amen. 
The word of God and the spirit of God want to give you wisdom and light the pathway of direction before you. Naya, could you come to the keyboard for me? The second scripture I wanted you to see is 1 John 2.20. It says you have an unction from the Holy One and you know all things. I know I've preached on this before about unction. The word is charisma. It means the anointing. And what it's describing is, is that when you got saved, the Holy Spirit lives in your heart. And when you put, apply yourself to the Word of God, and the Holy Spirit of God living on the inside of you, when you don't know which way to go, the presence of God will speak to you. And He will lead you, and He will guide you in unchartered territory. He will be your compass. He will be your God. But you're going to have to follow after Him. Not the preacher. Not your best friend. Not the person that you just looked in their eyeballs earlier that I asked you to look into. No. You need to hear from the Lord. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask Nadia just to play a song. And I want you to know that their altars are always open. Amen. If you've never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior before, I want to encourage you to come up for prayer. You need to receive Jesus. Amen. And I also want to tell you another thing. If you need prayer for anything, 